Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm Papa Salif So from the University of Dakar, Senegal, and the International Aid Society Governance Council from Africa. And I would like to make the presentation of the EISTB HIV Research Prize. The International Aid Society and its partners are proud to sponsor a number of scientific prizes and awards aim at rewarding promising researchers who are doing outstanding research on HIV and AIDS. The aim of this 2000 US dollar international AIDS prize on TB HIV research is to generate interest and stimulate research on basic clinical and operation research on TB, HIV prevention, care, and treatment. The International Aid Society TB HIV Research Prize is an incentive for researchers to investigate pertinent research questions that affect TB, HIV co-infection and operational effectiveness of core TB HIV collaborative services. The winning abstract was selected through a rigorous process of blind submission and peer review, and the top scoring TB HIV abstract were further reviewed by a steering committee of TB and HIV experts. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2020, the 2010 EIS-TB HIV Research Prize is awarded to Catherine Trodis from Human Rights Watch United Kingdom. And this prize was awarded for the outstanding abstract on HIV and TB management in six Zambian prisons demonstrate improved but ongoing prevention, testing, and treatment gaps. Thank you, Papa Salif. Merci, Papa Salif. Congratulations um, to the winner. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and dear colleagues and friends in the audience and on the podium. We're about to start um, this session on TB and HIV, and I must say, I'm really very pleased uh, that I have the honor of chairing this session. This is an issue that I consider of the highest importance in the fight against HIV AIDS. The Global Fund, as you know, is the Global Fund for AIDS, for tuberculosis and malaria. And I must say that 2010 is a year of concern to me. Concerns, uh, concerned because of the magnitude of the problem. Programmatic concerns. I do hear progress. I do hear progress, particularly as Marcos was just telling me, around how HIV is better and better somehow integrated into TB programs, but much less progress the other way around, that is integration of TB into HIV programs. I'm also, as you've been hearing throughout this conference, concerned about the future funding of the fight against AIDS and of the fight against tuberculosis in this year, 2010, a year of replenishment of the Global Fund. And here, 
again, particularly concerned when it comes to MDR-TB. The Global Fund is the, basically the only funder of MDR-TB. We're currently funding somewhere around 35,000 people on treatment, which is at least if, perhaps even less than one-tenth of the people who should be receiving such treatment. So we're in a real challenge and, and, and crisis, and this is what we need to discuss very openly in this forum, and I'd like all of the speakers to address it openly and to bring solutions and, and, and suggest pathways for, for action and to move forward. It is now my privilege to introduce the first speaker of this session. He is a champion for the fight against tuberculosis. He is the special envoy of the Secretary General of the United Nations for tuberculosis and a wonderful person um, whose generosity we, we all know and appreciate. Former President of Portugal, President Sampaio. Good, good morning uh, or good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kazatskin, for your kind words. Uh, my greetings to the, everyone who is here at this time of the day. Uh, it's a great honor to um, be here, and I'm very grateful to the International Aid Society for inviting me today. And I am also uh, particularly uh, grateful that uh, it was possible during this immense uh, conference to have a joint session precisely on the importance, the rising importance between HIV and TB or, as Professor has said, the other way around. This uh, invitation, ladies and gentlemen, testifies its increased role together with the global HIV stakeholders in recognizing the need to address tuberculosis prevention, diagnosis and treatment as an essential component of HIV response. And I would like to praise it for this very significant step forward. Let's face reality. Tuberculosis remains the leading cause of death among people living with HIV. In 2008, tuberculosis accounted for over half a million AIDS-related deaths. That is more than one in every four AIDS deaths. The risk of tuberculosis is over 30 times higher among people living with HIV and in some African countries up to 80% of TB patients are also living with HIV. It affects women and men and leaves children orphaned. In some settings tuberculosis disproportionately affects women living with HIV and their unborn and born children. In Europe the joint convergence of drug-resistant tuberculosis with HIV particularly affects those made vulnerable by injecting drug use and those in prison settings. People living with HIV are unnecessarily dying from their tuberculosis, a curable disease. This is why since the very beginning of my appointment as the UN Secretary General Special Envoy to Stop Tuberculosis, I have consistently and insistently focused many of my activities on increasing political attention to the interlinked TB-HIV co-epidemic, as well as to address the threat of multi-drug and extensively drug-resistant TB. In June 2008, more, than, more or less two years ago, I convened the HIV-TB Global Leaders Forum for the first time ever, heads of government, public health and business leaders, heads of United Nations agencies, and activists came together at the United Nations headquarters to discuss the urgent need for collaboration to save lives among people living with HIV and tuberculosis. After that, I personally committed at the Clinton Global Initiative to focus my activities on urging global leaders to engage in supporting the coordination of tuberculosis and HIV services. Together with the regional director of WHO Regional Office for Africa, 
we called on African ministers of health to set ambitious national targets to mobilize appropriate funding to tackle the TB HIV co-epidemic and to marshal HIV affected communities, broader civil society and the private sector for precisely a response to tuberculosis. On World AIDS Day 2009, I had the opportunity to visit two of the highest burden countries for TB and HIV, Ethiopia and Kenya, where I reminded political leaders of the urgent need to tackle TB and HIV because of their negative impact of, on GDP and of their profound social disruptive effect. Dear friends, most of the time headlines focus on bad news. But let's also future good news because they are a powerful stimulus to progress in our endeavors and to bring people to the most in need, bring hope to the most in need. Let's be clear. In the last few years, there has been, as Professor Kazachkin has mentioned, considerable progress in the provision of HIV testing for tuberculosis patients the gateway to other services such as antiretroviral therapy. In 2008, 1. million notified TB cases were HIV tested, more than 60 times higher over six years since 2002. There is also steady improvement in providing TB prevention and diagnosis services for people living with HIV. This is good news, just to be underlined to spur on us to greater commitment, greater commitment, greater ambition, and greater achievements, in particular in areas where advancements lag behind. In 2008, only 4% of people living with HIV were screened for TB, 4%. This is clearly not enough, and I dare say it is clearly not acceptable. We need not to do more of what we know that works. We also need to do more to address the key drivers of the tuberculosis and HIV epidemics in most affected regions, such as the WHO European region and settings like prisons, and to address TB toll on most vulnerable groups, such as women, children, and migrants. Just take the example of the WHO European region, that in spite of comprising some of the richest more developed countries of the world hides the dark reality of the White Plague, in particular in prisons, because of injection drug use, because of the increasing threat of drug-resistant tuberculosis, but also because of prevailing stigma and discrimination. This region has the highest levels of drug-resistant tuberculosis in the world, with one in four new tuberculosis patients in some areas of Eastern Europe have multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Moreover, evidence seems to show that dangerous drug resistant strains are spreading person to person at an alarming frequency in this region. The region is also under the threat of an HIV epidemic which is likely to further increase the number of new cases of TB and new HIV infections are on the rise in those countries with higher proportions of multi-resistance TB cases. Take now the dire situation in prisons. In some countries, HIV prevalence among prisoners is 10 times higher than in the general population. And most of HIV infection occurs in places of pre-trial detention. This clearly calls for a clear human rights approach to ensuring safe detention or avoiding detention altogether through prison reform under no circumstances. Getting TB and or HIV during incarceration should be a part of a prisoner's sentence. Take also the case of the injection, injection drug use that has driven the HIV epidemic in many countries and has also increased rates of tuberculosis irrespective of whether they live with HIV or not. People who use drugs are often marginalized and highly stigmatized by health workers and society as a whole. They often have complex health needs and poor access to life-saving interventions. 
collaboration, collaboration, I insist, between tuberculosis, HIV, and harm reduction programs to provide integrated and holistic services in countries with drug use problems is absolutely essential and critical to the health of drug users. Look now at the interlinked epidemics of TB and HIV that is taking a dramatic toll on women's lives, notably in countries with high HIV prevalence. While TB is now the third leading cause of death among women aged 15 to 44, killing some 700,000 women every year and causing illness in millions more, it is particularly lethal for women living with HIV. Studies are increasingly revealing the important implications of the TB-HIV co-infection for maternal and child health. Yet the burden of the dual TB-HIV epidemic on women and the gender-related barriers to detection and treatment are not being addressed explicitly by global donors, national health systems, or community groups. The urgency of this situation, ladies and gentlemen, demands that TB is elevated as a key women's health issue and that screening, prevention, and treatment be made a routine part of HIV, reproductive health, and maternal and child health services. The lives of millions of women depend on our ability to move this agenda forward. Finally, take the case of vulnerable groups such as migrants, refugees, detained asylum seekers, and internal displaced populations who are many millions. TB and HIV are a great risk to this group of people who have usually no access to the health system or are held in congregate settings which in fact exacerbate their vulnerability. Here again, infection with tuberculosis and or HIV should not be a direct consequence of being poor and marginalized. Ladies and gentlemen, stigma and discrimination is a common feature that affects all these risk or vulnerable groups, those with both drug-sensitive and drug-resistant tuberculosis and their families. Hospitalized treatment and isolation of patients of TB impinge on human rights, provides unnecessary stress on the social life of the patients and their families, and of course, on the health systems. Moreover, experience and evidence from other regions show that outpatients, ambulatory and community-based management of tuberculosis, including of drug-resistant TB and of HIV, is effective, possible, and client-friendly. Stigma and discrimination are simply not acceptable from a political perspective, and they are indeed condemnable from a human rights viewpoint, let alone on a purely human basis. What is the remedy to fight against prejudice and discrimination? Enhance community engagement, for sure. But you also need firm political commitment, firm political commitment, to uphold the rights of the most vulnerable groups, as well as expanded health policies whose ownership is fully endorsed by national health authorities and communities. For that, ladies and gentlemen, we need to call upon all governments, poor and rich, endemic and donors, to ensure prevention and care for TB, HIV, collaborative activities that are fully funded and accessible to all people regardless of race, gender, and sexual orientation. We need to call upon all partners to fund technical assistance of leading international public health agencies such as WHO, UNAIDS, and other technical partners to countries that are able to ensure TB-HIV collaboratory activities are in place. We need, of course, to call upon all stakeholders, governments, I insist, governments, change a little bit your budget options, not much, just a little bit, international agencies, corporations and philanthropic foundations to help meet the funding gaps of the Stop TB Partnership 
as well as a global fund, which is indeed the global fund, the largest donor for TB and HIV services to achieve the goals set in the global plan to stop TB, which complements the Millennium Development Goals to on TB. The health-related MDG, ladies and gentlemen, are closely interrelated. Success in meeting them will only be realized and effective through a comprehensive approach. I insist, a comprehensive approach and not through programs isolated from each other. This is why I think, this is my personal conviction, that although we need to continue investment in what has worked, we must not simply do more of the same. With regard to TB, this means that we need to reframe it from a disease or a public health problem to, in fact, a development predicament. With regard to TB HIV, this means a new vision that sees zero tolerance towards non-integrated approaches. I am sure that altogether we will not let more people living with HIV dying from TB. We simply can't afford this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. President Sampaio for those words and for your strong advocacy. I'd like now to call on Timur Abdullaev, who is a human rights, AIDS and TB consultant and activist um, from Uzbekistan. And I would then like ask, uh, to, to ask you some of our friends and, and colleagues sitting here in the front who demonstrate and rightly so, to stop people living with HIV, dying from TB, to come to the podium. Let's hear from Timur first. Dear colleagues, dear friends, it is my great pleasure to be here and to speak, but also it is a great responsibility because I speak not only on my own behalf, but also on behalf of thousands and thousands of people living with HIV and having TB. In my presentation, I would like to say something about human rights. Unfortunately, I will not be able really to, to be comprehensive on this issue, but I will try to give some insights or highlights of human rights that are associated with the right not to have TB, to live a life free from TB. Is there such right, actually? If we look into international human rights standards, international human rights documents, we will not see this right. But does this mean that this right does not exist? I think no, and let's look at discrimination. Isn't it discrimination when drug users with TB are turned out from TB hospitals just because they are seen under the influence of drugs or alcohol? That happens in a lot of places throughout Eastern Europe and Central Asia, and I think globally. Isn't it discrimination when HIV-positive prisoners with TB have limited or no access to treatment, to HIV and TB treatment, which is available to people outside prisons? Can we speak about the right to highest attainable standard of health, really, when there are no pediatric formulations, when children take the same drugs and the same dosage for TB as adults? Or when people on TB treatment face stockouts of drugs or get drugs that are actually expired? When diagnostics does not allow timely detection of extrapulmonary and even pulmonary TB, doesn't it amount to inhuman and degrading treatment when 
a drug user cannot leave a TB hospital where there is no access to opioid substitution treatment, where there is no detoxification services, and from where he or she is not actually free to leave. And when he or she leaves, he or she cannot return and continue treatment. That actually happened in some places, and one particular example is Ekaterinburg TB Hospital. After advocacy campaign by activists, the doors of the hospital were closed, and people who used drugs, they could not leave, or if they wished to leave, they could not return there. Finally, isn't it a violation of the right to life when people die from a disease that is largely preventable and curable? We all know that TB is still the leading cause of death for people living with HIV. Globally, one of four people with HIV die because of TB. And uh, just as an example, in Ukraine, actually, 75% of deaths of people with HIV are caused by TB co-infection. Isn't it striking? And isn't it really a violation of the right to life when this can be actually fixed? There are many reasons that can create this, that, that create these problems. I will mention some of them which are widespread in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, but some of them are quite global. These include poor conditions in TB hospitals and prisons, widespread injecting drug use, the problem of this region, the driving force of the HIV epidemic. And I should also say that in this region we have the highest rates of HIV spread in the world. I also want to mention low awareness about TB. And uh, one problem that I also want to mention is the problem with staff, with medical personnel who work on tuberculosis. Very often in our region, these people are quite old and uh, they just can't find another job. That's why they work on tuberculosis. Of course, I cannot skip the problem of stigma and discrimination, which is associated with HIV and tuberculosis. And the problem which is very widespread in this region, but also I believe in many countries of the world, is the lack of collaboration between the services, HIV services and tuberculosis services. But are these reasons actually enough to justify violations of human rights that I mentioned. I would like to show you a couple of pictures and I would like to thank Dmitro Sherenbe of all Ukrainian network of people living with HIV for sharing these pictures. This is a typical hospital in our region, a uh, typical prison in our region. And I think you can see prisons in that kind of condition in many countries of the world, not just in our region. And another picture is a picture of a person who is in a TB hospital. No comments, probably. I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timur. Uh, for this presentation and for the focus on, on this region that we all of us want to focus a lot during this particular conference. Uh, I would like now to call on Lucy and uh, friends and colleagues from the front row somehow to come and speak um, on behalf of, of those of you who demonstrate here. Thank you very much, Michelle. On behalf of people living with HIV and AIDS around the world, 
I just want to echo the sentiments of the previous speaker who said that I think for way too long our rights, of, uh, our rights as people living with HIV and AIDS have actually been violated. Why are our rights being violated? And the basic reason is when you deny somebody a TB test as a woman living with HIV or as a person living with HIV, you're basically violating their rights. Our message is we have spoken too long, made good promises about TB, HIV. It's time for us to take action so that we can prevent people living with HIV from dying from TB. And the challenge is basically in your court. Join us, let's help the world and join the fight in accelerating efforts so that we can stop people living with HIV from dying of TB. And some more words from Eastern, Eastern Europe, Russia in particular, although many, many was said already during this session and some others. But I would like to stress from country where uh, TB treatment is in some regions not available, especially MDR treatment, where drug users uh, can't get, uh, with drug users with HIV and TB can't get harm reduction and proper TB treatment and, and uh, drug treatment. And situation is uh, getting worse because the Global Fund unfortunately live in the country because the government uh, does not support it to stay. And uh, there will be 14,000 people left without treatment very, very soon. And we kindly ask international community to support civil society in uh, making the Global Fund staying in the country not to uh, not to leave, uh, not to not to have more TB deaths because without antiretroviral treatment there will be much more TB deaths in the country where TB is now is leading this uh, reason among people with HIV thank you very much and I have a petition here to sign to the global fund and who wants please come to me at the end of the session to sign it thank you Thank you. Thank you to both of you for raising the issues. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce my friend and long-standing friend and colleague, Michel Sidibé. Everyone knows Michel is the executive director of UNAIDS and he will provide us with a UNAIDS perspective on TBHIV. Michel. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. Uh, good afternoon to all of you, and I want to start by uh, just uh, say thanks uh, to President Sampaio uh, for his uh, tireless work on these issues. He was uh, really instrumental uh, in uh, bringing uh, all the different uh, constituency around uh, uh, this issue, and he was uh, always uh, trying to make sure that we build the bridge between uh, TB and HIV, instead uh, uh, building a uh, wall. And I want to say thank you to you, thanks for uh, your work, and I know how much you're busy. I want to thank all the other panelists. But let me just go to uh, my uh, points. First, I want to say, like I heard you right now uh, mentioning that it is unacceptable that uh, the main cause of illnesses and death uh, amongst uh, people living with HIV is a curable and a preventable disease. It is unacceptable. Today we are talking about almost uh, 500,000 uh, people living with HIV uh, dying from uh, co-infection. And uh, that is uh, just an outrage. And I want to say that, and I say that is not acceptable. Only 4% of people living with HIV were screened for TB in 2008. We are just in 30 years almost we are in this epidemic. I think if we could have a, a, a scorecard, this scorecard would have shown how much we fail. Uh, to make sure that uh, we can deliver on these uh, long overdue uh, issues. Allow me to m say that uh, 
uh, we already have a tool, and a tool to greatly reduce, if not eradicate, this unnecessarily AIDS death we were just uh, talking about. And is a TB diagnosis, TB treatment, TB prophylaxis, better TB infection control in clinics and communities. They are existing. It's not just uh, that uh, we have to reinvent all of that. Our colleagues uh, have been working in uh, communities and also um, most of our partners in the from science to other part to make sure that at least uh, some of those tools are made available. We have been seeing a huge increase on financing. Michelle uh, 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 Kajashkin, my friend, have been always, always saying whatever the uh, place we were to go, that uh, we will not be able to control uh, uh, this uh, dual epidemic if we don't increase uh, the resource uh, uh, to TB, HIV uh, uh, co-infection. So I think for me, uh, resources have been also scaled up and uh, is very important for us uh, to know that that has been helping us uh, to scale up uh, uh, RV to all those in need. And uh, it's important to know that by increasing that one, it's helping us uh, not only to prevent the new HIV uh, infection, but also greatly reduce uh, uh, TB diseases and uh, death. And uh, I, I want uh, to, to, to say that for us, uh, the momentum is important. Where we are today, it's not a time to flatline, it's not time uh, to uh, scale down, it's time to scale up, it's not time to cut resources, it's time to make sure that we mobilize even more resources to uh, go uh, with a good result we have been already demonstrating. But we have many barriers, uh, uh, and we know most of them who have been uh, blocking us uh, uh, from uh, using those uh, tools uh, effectively and uh, efficiently. Some we have created ourselves to protect our turf. Like I said, I think uh, it's time to take AIDS out of isolation. And we have been so much, and I want uh, to say that because I know in this room it's not uh, only TB uh, people who are here, we have the privilege to have uh, AIDS movement and TB movement here. So it's time really to forget about our flag, forget about our turf, and trying to take it out of isolation and demonstrate that uh, it will bring a certainly, like in Kailelisha, uh, reduction on mortality. It will help us uh, to reach more people, and it will bring more cost-effective approach, and it will certainly uh, bring the whole concept of value for money in period where we are just all uh, faced by forced austerity. So I want to just say one of the first barriers is uh, the barrier we have been creating ourselves, barriers uh, uh, between uh, disease programs that attempt to protect uh, scare resources, uh, barriers uh, created uh, by not uh, listening uh, to and not uh, mainfully uh, engaging uh, affected uh, communities. And I think that is the, the part of the revolution which will certainly change more than anything else to overcome those barriers, to be able to be more attentive to each other and make sure that we are not just thinking about our programs in isolation and knowing, like I said, I remember in Brazil, uh, when we were together there, that um, if uh, a virus and uh, a bacteria can work together to kill someone, why we cannot work together to save people? So I think for me that is not more complicated than that one. So together, these two diseases eat away at the margin of the society. I've been traveling so much and uh, people can tell me whatever they want. When I am seeing the picture you have been presenting, 
you know, I, I, I want to cry because I, I don't have any other things than just saying that it's so painful that in the uh, 21st century we can uh, still see those type of uh, uh, pictures. And, uh, and I, I realize that uh, TB is really a, 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 a poor people disease. You go to any places, uh, this uh, is eating people at the margin, people who don't have access to information. It is uh, centrally a issues of social justice. It is centrally a issues of lack of proper redistribution of opportunity to reach people who don't have. And I think for me, we need to rethink completely uh, 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 our approaches, because what I'm seeing is that all of that are uh, uh, fed by uh, prejudice, uh, inequalities, and the most vulnerable members of, of uh, our communities are uh, faced with major challenge to be part of the transformation we are proposing. So it is critical to put uh, people at the centers of our response. I think, um, uh, like it managed to do, uh, I don't think so. Uh, uh, we will be able to resolve this problem only by uh, 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 looking on medical side. Is medical side is so important, but when I'm seeing the vulnerability, when I'm seeing how people are exposed, I just said that certainly our programmatic approach need to make also this shift to think about moving a little bit from commodity approach to community approach. And putting people at the center of the response will reduce the risk, the risk of TB and HIV, which is without any doubt uh, uh, growing when people are denied uh, uh, adequate nutrition and housing. We, without any doubt, we are seeing that have a, uh, a very strong correlation between them. When they are denied uh, from uh, basic health uh, uh, services, safe uh, workplaces, health sites, and uh, detention centers. And I think it is, this meeting in Vienna is happening in a defining moment. And I don't want us to leave Vienna by just doing business as usual. Because I don't think so. The last 30 years have been wonderful. But if we want really to use our collective energy, with the force I saw in the road when we were walking, uh, asking for rights, I think we need to canalize that uh, towards a new generation of a response. New generation of response, which will make us uh, certainly emerging a new activism at the community levels, make sure that we can uh, mobilize uh, 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 community groups and uh, 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 communities organizations to be more at the center of the delivery system. And I, I, I believe on that. Maybe I am naive, but uh, I continue to believe that uh, uh, change happens because society on it. I continue to believe that democratization of problem solving is the only way to make a sustainable re response. And uh, integration in that case is the only answer. I don't see any other answer. Uh, connect the global AIDS response uh, uh, to the TB movement and uh, forge a broader uh, coalition uh, to gain uh, a political traction uh, for a final push to MDGs is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is long overdue. And if we don't do that one, uh, we will uh, again miss the opportunity which we have today. Work more closely with our partners to deliver integrated services to those most uh, in need. And I think uh, direct uh, combined resources uh, on the highest burden uh, countries, m more than half of the global uh, burden of HIV related TB occurs in, most, uh, in just uh, five countries. So it's important for us to not forget that. And uh, if we want uh, in, uh, in, uh, in um, uh, Washington, uh, two years down on the road, to come with uh, a major breakthrough in Washington, we need uh, to also have the courage to uh, be uh, selective and uh, be more smarter and focus where we have a, a huge burden. That doesn't mean we exclude uh, the others in our response, but it will help us to have a result. This is a golden moment uh, for the TB and HIV collective response.
First, more than 60 countries are due to revise their national strategic plan for AIDS in the near future. This is an opportunity to influence the change. I think we should not miss that one at country level to strengthen the role of a national AIDS council and uh, HIV program to be able to take more on board of these all TB issues and uh, certainly set ambitious targets to reduce the TB death in uh, people living with HIV. Finally, I want to just uh, to end uh, by saying that uh, um, WHO will soon release a new guidelines on TB uh, screening and uh, uh, preventive therapy. We must urgently implement them if we are to cut uh, in half the TB death in the people living with HIV by 2015. I am calling today again because uh, I love uh, trying to be practical. I am calling uh, on you, the HIV community, to use this uh, golden moment to push now for 100% TB screening for all people living with HIV. And I want to... <laughs> and I am ending by uh, saying that I'm so happy uh, to be uh, today with uh, Marcos. Marcos, uh, probably uh, it's your uh, last big meeting in your position, and I want to say how much Marcos has been transforming this fight, and join me to say thanks to Marcos. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Michel. Thank you. Um, and thank you for that call. I will now give the, the floor to Marcos. Um, I really um, would like to, to take on what Michel just said. And Marcos' contribution while he was at the Stop TB Partnership has been fantastic. and. Uh, at least for some time, we're partly losing a friend and a colleague in the fight against tuberculosis and in the fight against uh, tuberculosis and AIDS. So just as Michel did, please allow me to do it as well. Let's stand up for a second and really recognize Marcos. Muchas gracias, Marcos. The floor, see, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, the two Michels. Like, we call them, we call them like that. And when we go to the meetings of the Global Fund, meetings of UNAIDS board, and then the two Michels. So, they have done so much already for these two diseases. You know, it's difficult for me to address you because I'm the last. And the last is always more difficult. But they always say, save the best for last, no? So let's try. Um, thank you, Michel, CDV, Michel Kasaskin, President Sampaio. Thank you, Tafir. Um, I want to thank the International Aid Society for finally making sure TB HIV is on the agenda. This is very good. But I wanted to make also a challenge to the International Aid Society that the next meeting, the room should be packed because it's not. That means still we need to do more work for TBHIV. We need to get the 20,000 people inside the room. It's not enough. Um, a special thanks to Diane Hablier member of the board of Stop TV who worked tirelessly to put this together. I, I'm sure maybe Diane is somewhere out there, but I want to make sure I recognize that. I mean, it is great to see all these leaders, and I'm not going to read a long speech, don't worry. Um, they all talk about one voice, but it's not about them. It's about you. It's about the people affected by these social problems. 
by these economic problems, but these human right problems, but this political problem. TB, HIV, it's a political and development problem. So be vigilant. And I'm going to go back before then. A year ago, Michel Sidibe and I went to South Africa. We met the deputy president. We met the minister of health. We told them where were the problems. When we were seeing HIV, people living with HIV receiving care in one center and people living with TB receiving care in the other center, we said, this is impossible. A couple of days after, the deputy president addressed the International AIDS Society and committed to change. And we are very impressed in the short period of time how South Africa is moving. And still, they have a long way to go. But, I'm... but we are all confident they will move because the, every time they have been fully committed now from the new government started to ensure TB, HIV, it's addressed. Ladies and gentlemen, the population of South Africa is 1% with TB. 1% of the population. And HIV, I don't have to tell you. So kudos to South Africa for moving. But it's not only South Africa. Many other countries need to massively accelerate their commitment to TB HIV. The Stop TB Partnership has launched the Global Plan to Stop TB in 2006. This fall, we are releasing the last, a new version of the Global Plan because it's the last five years to push for the Millennium Development Goals. We are revising all the numbers with one aim, universal access. 100% of people living with HIV being tested for TB. I want the IAS to be a leader, a champion. 100% of people living with TB being tested for HIV and vice versa. There are actions that can be implemented. There is no way we can continue like that. We should, by 2015, achieve all these targets. There is no way why not. We should be able to say that everyone living with HIV, it's with antiretrovirals, receiving antiretrovirals and cotrimoxazole. We need to implement the three I's, infection control, intensive case finding, and INH preventive therapy. The people living with HIV are dying of TB. It's one out of four. Either you take it or we die. Everyone is at risk of HIV. Everyone is at risk of TB. These are social problems. This is in the society. This is not in a slum. It's everywhere. So we need to make sure we all embrace TB, HIV, the fight. Because today we are embracing it. And Michel Sidive, I give it to Michel Sidive. As soon as he took over in UNAIDS, he said, TB is one of my priority. But the work is not yet done. We need to make sure the National AIDS Council, the National AIDS Program embrace TB. As Michel Kasaskin said at the beginning, a lot of progress has been made in the side of TB. Many people with TB have been tested for HIV. But it's the other side also that needs to be taken into account. And we need to make sure that happens. Ladies and gentlemen, there are tools we can make progress. But we are also working, the Stop TB Partnership is working very hard to have new tools in place. There are about 10, 12 vaccines now being in clinical trials for TB. Remember, our vaccine is, is more than 100 years old. There are several drugs for, against TB and multi-drug resistant TB that are becoming and are being tested now. So we expect we need to, we, we are going to introduce, and we will, we will introduce. Not me, I'm leaving us, you heard. It's the movement that needs to continue. It's the bottom-up approach that needs to continue to ensure that new diagnostics, new drugs, and new vaccines are rolled out. It is a human rights tragedy. TB is a tragedy 4,000 years with us. It can be cured with $25. Ladies and gentlemen, we collectively are not doing enough. The rhetoric is not acceptable anymore unless we show evidence and facts that we are all 
firmly moving. Governments, as President Sampaio said, need to move. After all, it's not me who's going to tackle the problem of HIV TB in South Africa. It's the South African people. And this is why you need to be vigilant. You need to demand from governments, rich and poor. I'm very pleased when I see the, the G8 and the G20 a few weeks ago to commit to address MDG4 and MDG5, finally, because it's not acceptable that women and children continue dying. There are 3.6 million women affected by TB every year. There are 700,000 women dying of TB. And we all go for it, MDG4 and MDG5. But what is not acceptable to me is the predicament that we are going to fund MDG4 and MDG5 because TB and HIV are doing well. No, MDG4, MDG5, and MDG6 needs to be fully funded. We need to fully fund the global fund to, st uh, to fight HIV and malaria. We cannot go back. We cannot go back. We cannot lose the games. And the Global Fund is the largest funder of tuberculosis, also of malaria. Let's stop that hypocrisy. These three diseases kill six million people every year. It's not about neglecting one to favor another. We still have a long way to go. So I ask you all to be vigilant to be vocal and demand from all your governments, rich and poor at once and for all, to do what is right for the millions of people living with TB and HIV. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcos. And before we move to the um, very last part of this program, um, I'd like to perhaps ask two or three of you whether someone would like to react to what, to what we heard from President Sampaio, from Timur, from Michel, from Marcos. Anyone would wish to come to one of the microphones and ask a question, give a comment? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, yes, my name is Luis Mendo. I'm the... Sorry, I didn't okay. see you. Microphone three, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, my name is Luis Mendão. I'm the current uh, co-chair of the Civil Society Forum on HIV AIDS of the European Union. And I thank you for the, this session and thank you for the leadership that uh, you committed. But I think there are at least two points that should as not to do business as, as usual. And in this time where financial crisis is present, is that we need not only to connect HIV with TB, but also with drug use and poverty. Uh, without evidence and human rights based policies for these two problems, I don't think we can get money enough to uh, control or stop people living with HIV dying from TB. So, thanks again also for the Vienna Declaration. I think of what I know from the uh, history of commitments and challenges of President Sampaio, that you, Michael Kazakhstan, could invite him to subscribe the declaration. Uh, but really, I think that if the leaders are not able to provide better evidence and human rights based health policies for migration, for poverty and for uh, drug users, we will not win this combat. And we have seen uh, days ago that the new uh, uh, partner of the UNAIDS family did put as a czar uh, someone coming from the country with the worst record on drug policy, that is, I would uh, say, a lack of courage uh, from you, U European Union, United States, everyone, not to stop this nomination that will greatly negatively impact on the efforts that we need to, to do to achieve a drug policy uh, just and evidence-based. Thanks. Thank you.
Thank you, and uh, I'd just like to remind everyone here to be ready and consider signing the Vienna Declaration. Microphone one. Hello. My name is uh, Lone Torpens, and I'm representing an organization called Humana People to People. And we have uh, devoted for, for many years uh, ourselves to the fight against the AIDS epidemic through a program called Total Control of the Epidemic. It's known as TCE. And we have been reaching more than 10 million people in the Southern African region going door to door. Our field officers go door to door and engage with people to, to give them education, to make sure that they, they get tested, make sure they get on treatment and so on. And we have realized also through the last years that we have to strengthen our efforts about integrating TB into our program so that we uh, make sure that our field officers are well educated on TB and can give people the right information. And we can see now that funding is starting to flow. Of course, it's much too little. It's always too little. But uh, there are some funding starting to flow and we have now started a systematic approach where in the communities where our field officers go, we are now reaching six million people on a daily basis. We will make sure that people uh, get the information on TB, that all people who are HIV positive are screened. We will work with the clinics uh, and we will also make sure that people who are t have TB are tested for HIV. So that's, I just wanted to make that Thank commitment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before I give the floor to President Sampaio for a special announcement, um, with, I'd like to, Andrietta asked me to leave a little space so that we hear again the Vuvuzelas. And on behalf of the South Africans, Andrietta, maybe it's for you to give this. This is a token of appreciation to Marcos. And so I will now hand the, the microphone to President Sampaio for this announcement. President Sampaio. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I am d really delighted to announce that right here, um, the uh, UNAIDS uh, and the Stop TB Partnership have agreed to sign in front of you uh, a memorandum of understanding which really translates uh, the words into uh, future actions. Uh, the memorandum sets out a uh, roadmap of how they are going to work together to half tuberculosis deaths in people living with HIV by 2015 and save at least a quarter of a million lives every year. They, uh, the memorandum, I think, uh, is a very significant progress in the sense that it commits UNAIDS and the partnership to work together to raise new resources for TB HIV, to advocate for new tools to prevent diagnosis and treat tuberculosis in people living with HIV, strengthen the capacity of communities to meaningfully engage in our efforts to stop tuberculosis deaths in people living with HIV, and critically the development of uh, the tuberculosis and human rights task force to drive human rights-based approach to HIV and TB. So, my dear friends, Marcus and Michelle, um, I'm following the trend of saying Marcus and Michelle, um, I invite you to publicly sign, which you're already doing, this memorandum here at age 2010, and to show your joint commitment to halving tuberculosis deaths among people living with HIV by 2015. So, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Congratulations, and um, I just asked Michel whether he would allow me uh, to say that the content of that MOU will be posted on the website, both websides, so that everyone can know what it is that they just signed. So thank you all for uh, having uh, attended this session. Thank you for um, your commitment to the fight so that we stop people living with HIV dying from TB. Thank you.